We have the keynote speaker, uh, Matthias Kirchner, and he, worked, he is the president of FSFE, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, and uh, he is going to be speaking a little bit about uh, open source software and public administration, and briefly touch on um, uh, Munich's decision um, to, to, to revert back to proprietary. So please welcome, to, help welcome him to the stage. So, hello everybody. I saw that there was a long queue, so I guess some people will join us a little bit later. Thank you very much for the invitation. Before I start, who of you uh, was already involved in SUSE in the 1990s? Anyone here? Okay. So, in uh, 1999, I was facing a problem at home. I had uh, two computers in two different rooms and they were connected with a, uh, with a Ethernet cable and I somehow got the idea that it would be really nice to write an email from one of the computers to, the, uh, to my brother in the other room. And also both of those computers had uh, email programs installed. I was not able to accomplish that without connecting with the modem to the internet. And then I complained about that in school. And a friend of mine, he said, well, I have something for you. And he brought me some uh, SUSE floppies and CDs at that time and said, with that you can achieve it. It took me several hours to install that and then to see uh, some white font on a black screen and some more hours till I had a graphical user interface. And I had to learn lots and lots more uh, during the next uh, months until I was able to set up a mail server for the local network. But yeah, that got me started in free software. Later in 2004, I joined the FSFE. So those of you who were already responsible at that uh, involved in that time, you are partly responsible that I'm here today. So thank you for that. And uh, to the ones, to the, all the rest of you, I thank you for helping others nowadays to join uh, the free software movement. So yeah, I was invited to talk about the Linux project and the status of it. I will briefly tell you a bit about the history of the project and then I will, uh, I will raise a lot of questions and I hope that you will go with more questions than you came. And uh, afterwards I will give you a short example of uh, what the FSFE will do in the uh, future in the public administrations. So first of all, where did, how did the Linux project start? In the early 2000s, public administrations had the problem that the support for Windows NT uh, for workstation ended. A little bit like nowadays, a lot of administrations had that problem with Windows XP. So they had to upgrade their systems. And Munich thought that this is a good opportunity to evaluate if it's the best way to just continue and upgrade to a newer version of Microsoft or if there are other options. So they did an analysis of that and came to the conclu conclusion that GNU Linux would also be an alternative to switch to. They had long debates, lots of discussions and evaluation about that. Uh, at one point, and also the, uh, at that time, CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, he made a break in his skiing holidays, came to Munich, talked with the mayor uh, to convince him that they shouldn't do this step. Still, in 2004, the city council in Munich decided to switch to uh, free software operating system, their Linux client for their workstations. So that was the start. But then, already a few weeks later, they stopped the project. Why? Because there was the fear that software patents uh, might be a legal problem for uh, Linux systems and uh, maybe because of that they should not switch to a free operating system. They then had an analysis of that problem again and uh, the outcome was that it's not a bigger problem for them if they are using uh, free software than proprietary software with the, uh, with the software patents, so they decided to continue. But that was the beginning of regular rumors about the stop of the, uh, of the Linux project. 
it regularly came back. So one of those uh, reasons why they, uh, why they stopped uh, or why there were rumors about them stopping the project was often connected with costs. So um, there were times when, when people argued that the project is more expensive than if they are, would run a Microsoft operating system. So the uh, CSU, which was at that time in the opposition, they filed requests to, uh, to show how much exactly they are saving with that or if it wouldn't be more expensive. The IT committee at that time, they made an analysis and came to the conclusion that they are saving 20 million with their project. But then there was another time when there was a study by HP and they said uh, Munich would save 40 million euro uh, or 43 million euro if they would switch to Microsoft Windows for their operating systems. They didn't publish that study for quite a long time. Uh, and in the end, it also turned out that Microsoft paid for this study. But things like that, the connection with the costs was a regular uh, thing where people said, oh, it's too expensive, the project will stop, they will switch back to Microsoft Windows. Another reason which regularly came was the dissatisfaction of uh, their staff, their, uh, their users with the system. So there were always reports that uh, uh, the, the users there are unhappy with their IT, they are not happy with the Linux client, sometimes there were numbers like 20% of the people there are absolutely unhappy, sometimes it was that 40% of the people there were unhappy with the, with the system. But it was always something uh, which was very sketchy, the public news about that. So it was never clear what exactly they were unhappy about. They had some internal reports, but they didn't publish them. So uh, it was, uh, they, they were unhappy with some components, but you didn't know about what and if they were connected with the Linux client or with some other uh, components of the system. There was also never a comparison in the news um, how those satisfaction rate is connected to uh, the satisfaction of uh, users in other public administrations. I mean, if in other public administrations 50% of the people are absolutely unhappy, then 20% would be a good number. But there was never a comparison like that. So regularly it was reported that people are unhappy and because of that they are stopping the project. It was also sometimes not, not clear where this if this unhappiness, for example, could come from the organizational changes they made at the same time. So when they started the process to switch to the Linux client for the workstations, they also started to, um, to do organizational changes in their, in their structure on how the IT works. So before, people had their IT guy at the desk or the office next to them, and after this uh, migration, uh, this structural changes, when they had a problem, they were just one ticket in the ticket system. And that's also something which gives people the impression that it's, it's not so good as before. But yeah, it regularly came back. People are unhappy. That's, uh, that's the reason why uh, Munich will now stop and switch back to Microsoft Windows. Another reason which is also often, uh, which was also often noted was um, that Munich will switch back to Microsoft Office because of interoperability reasons. So they had the problem that other public administrations were uh, often still using uh, uh, Microsoft Office and were sending Microsoft Office formats to, uh, documents to them and they had a problem to process them. And even at that time the, the federal government uh, was sending proprietary documents to the city of Munich and asking them to fill that out for, for certain things. Also, at that time already, the federal administration in Germany, they had a decision that every federal administration should be able to receive, to um, edit and to send back ODF documents. But it's very difficult, of course, and also connected with the, with the example before, with the unhappiness of the users, that uh, when you try to tell your users that it's the other's fault, when all the others around them tell them it's your fault. So it's a very tough, tough place. But yeah, that was something which regularly pushed the rumors that they have to switch back and the project will fail. And then uh, there was another reason, which was 
nothing. So I had the impression that <clears throat> when there weren't any news about Linux for some time, people said, oh, I heard that they are now switching back to Microsoft Windows. So from my experience, that also happened. Still, despite all those, um, despite all those challenges, they have been able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to finish their project in 2013. So they have been able to migrate 15,000 workstations to their Linux client. And beside that, they have also been able to, uh, to migrate a lot of templates and unify those, all these uh, office templates. They also published um, uh, a software to take care about this template management, the Volmux uh, uh, software. So yeah, they accomplished that. And of course, such a migration, it's a very tough process with all the organizational changes they also were doing and then switching um, uh, an IT system which before that was depending a lot on uh, the software of a few vendors. In this process before, they always had the support from, uh, from their mayor and from the political leadership, uh, Christian Ude at that time, the mayor who started the project also in 2004. So whenever there were complaints from other departments, at least they know that uh, the, the leadership will somehow support what they are doing and whatever they are facing, they get some moral support. But that changed in 2014. There were new elections and then uh, the, the mayor before, he didn't run again. And uh, then uh, the, after the re-election, there was the uh, SPD, which was also the party of the mayor before, and the CSU, they made a coalition and are governing now together. And the new mayor is uh, um, Dieter Reiter, who is also from the SPD, but he was already before that not a big fan of the Linux project. He was uh, in some newspapers before quoted as Microsoft fan, and um, he also... Um, at that, uh, he was also very proud to uh, say that uh, he was he had an important role uh, that Microsoft was moving their headquarters to Munich, and he he was very involved in that. He claimed. So, from that time on, it seemed that Linux was somehow the the scope uh, uh, scapegoat for everything. So that started with things like. Uh, the new mayor from the CSU, he bought an iPhone and wanted to connect that to the mail servers, which were not supposed to, uh, to be connected with iPhones at that time. So whose fault is that? The Linux client, of course. Then uh, there was a mail server outage. What did the media report? The media reported that Dieter Reiter, the mayor of, uh, of, um, of Munich, said that uh, yeah, it's Linux fault, and if at least uh, if at least our systems would be better. Uh, so he was also claiming that this is the Linux, uh, it's, it's the fault of Linux. Also, it later turned out that Linux had nothing to do with this problem. So yeah, regularly in the press you could read that people were unhappy and uh, that that they now want to switch back. They were never. Uh, shy to say, yeah, we are switching back to Microsoft Windows now. And when you were traveling at that time, people all around the world, what they heard was, oh, Munich switched back to Microsoft Windows, right? So even now when you, when you meet people, they still think, well, they already switched like two years ago, didn't they? And yeah, so that was already from, from the overall picture, what people around the world think, what Munich is doing. They have already migrated to, to Microsoft Windows years ago. What happened next was that the, um, that the government, they, um, they paid for a study to evaluate their um, IT. And people already at the beginning when, uh, when the study was uh, started, already said, oh, it will be quite clear what the outcome will be, because the study was given to Accenture, which is, uh, uh, it was Microsoft, it, it's Microsoft Gold Partner uh, of the year for, I think, eight years in a row. Um, so they thought, okay, it's, it will be quite unlikely what, uh, that they will say anything positive about free software. But it didn't turn out like that. The outcome of the study was mainly that they highlighted organizational problems. So they said, yes, there are also technical challenges, but the biggest problem are the organizational 
uh, difficulties you're facing. For example, at, at that time, uh, um, one of the city council members, they said that uh, they have, uh, because no central entity can decide uh, when to apply an update, every uh, entity can do that then alone, every department can decide how to do that. They had, uh, they had phases where they have more than uh, around 10 to 15 different operating systems and versions there running. And there were uh, op um, open office versions from several years ago with bugs where people were com complaining about, which were already fixed for years. So yeah, they said their main recommendation was you have to fix those organizational problems and fix your structure. And then it was a little bit silent for some time again. And, um, and then there was a surprise motion in the city council. That was earlier this year. Uh, before there was something on the agenda about those organizational changes, they didn't take the, uh, the recommendations directly with, which Essentia was giving them. They, they found another, uh, another organizational structure which they wanted to do, but that was mainly on the agenda. And then a few days before the city council meeting, there was a slight update. It was under 6B new. And then they added a few words to say that uh, they, uh, they want to prepare a concept to move to unified Microsoft Windows client. And everybody was like, what? Where are supporting documents for that? Where, what costs uh, will be associated with that change? What, what plan do you have? But there was nothing. It was just those words there. So we thought that if they want to take this decision, they should at least take this decision with knowing the facts. They should be aware of what they are deciding about. So we gathered a lots, lots of questions, like how much will that cost? What dependencies do you have at the moment which might not run on a Microsoft Windows client? What will happen with your IT staff, which is now trained to, uh, to run the, the uh, free software operating system and, and uh, all the, uh, the software you are running at the moment? What will they do? Will they then just be uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows admins, or what will happen there? And with, together with other organizations, we gather lots of questions. And then we contacted all city council members and ask them to, before they take this decision, that they should answer those questions for themselves or ask the, uh, the government what, uh, what the answers to those questions are. And we also raise those questions with the press and to our supporters and ask them to ask their politicians about that. That resulted in a lot of questions <laughs> to the politicians there. So at the meeting, at the final meeting, uh, everybody of the city council, or several people from the city council were saying they never had so many requests by the public. They never had so many people interested in what they are doing there. They got so many questions there. And also from the press, it was not just the IT press which was there, there were also people there from, uh, with a TV team like um, Investigate Europe. It's a team of investigative journalists. They at that time also worked on a story on uh, the dependency of public administrations in Europe on Microsoft. When they heard about that, they went there with a, uh, with a camera team and recorded everything and made interviews. So there was a lot of attention about that. And um, due to that attention, I believe that uh, uh, the mayor had to move back a little bit. So he said, this was never supposed to be a decision to do that. It was just about examining it. And uh, so he, that's all recorded and, and uh, on and the video. And he said, well, it's, it's just about examining. We, it, it's not a final plan yet to, to do that. And during the, during the uh, city council meeting, um, the feedback from the opposition, there were people, they were very outraged that this was just put on the agenda a little bit before in a sub note, uh, just adding a few, a uh, few words there. So in the end, they agreed uh, to amend this decision. So they added that this new concept should also include like what software will afterwards not be used anymore, that this is clear which will not run afterwards. So everybody in the city knows, uh, in this uh, city administration knows what software they will not be able to use. They would have to provide a rough estimation of the costs at least, 
which is quite good because before that you heard lots of different numbers which were sometimes like 20 million, 40 million, 80 million or so. Uh, and I think it would be beneficial if they know a little bit clearer on how much money they would like to spend there. And it was added that the final decision about this move will be taken in the city council again. So that is not a decision, but it will be decided later in the city council. So that was the meeting in uh, earlier this year. But in the meeting, you could already hear that a lot of them, they were already convinced that they want to go back to Microsoft Windows, especially from the CSU and also some people from the SPD. Um, in, their, in their comments, they already said, I am very happy that we are now moving back to Microsoft Windows. And, and then they continue to argue. And even now, after, after those amendments, it's not clear to the people in the city council what exactly this is now about. Some people think it, they decided to move back to Microsoft Windows. Other things, no, it was just about a concept. So it's, it's quite some chaos there. But their plan is now to develop a concept so that they can switch all their workstations back to Microsoft Windows, to one Microsoft Windows client, till 2020. And beside that, also do those organizational changes they decided on. That should also happen till that time. So that's the, that's the plan at the moment. And we also hear again that they are now already internally preparing some things like changing budgets and already um, shutting down some services to already move in this direction. Also, there was no official decision yet and the city council did not take any decision. But still, I think it's fair to say that this is the end of a lighthouse. So it's not anymore the shining, uh, shining example of free software in the public administration if it was that before. So even so, there are people there who do good work and uh, who, who try hard to, to migrate to free software there and keep that running. If their boss constantly uh, discourage and sabotage their work instead of supporting them, something like that, you, you cannot do that. So the question is, is it all their fault? Is it their fault that they, uh, yeah, there was no political support, that, uh, that they made a lot of mistakes on how to, they handled that, and is it mainly on Munich? I think that this would be a bit too easy. And I think that if we have this approach, we will lose the uh, advantage to use this as a, um, as a moment to evaluate if maybe we also did some mistakes. Like all of us here, if some of us also made things which made it more likely for this migration not to, to work out or also for other migrations that they don't work out. So I, I would like to raise a few questions and I'm very much looking forward to your answers to that afterwards in the discussion. And yeah, so first question, do we suck at desktop? So, I mean, free software, it's very dominant in a lot of places. We have supercomputers running free software, all kind of servers. We have a lot of embedded devices. Cars are now running free software. Uh, we have them in, in so many places, f mobile phones. You have everywhere, you have free software operating systems. But in the desktop area, even a lot of people in our community are using proprietary operating systems there. So why? I think that's something which we should think about and if we can come up with solutions on fixing that. It's also, yeah, there could be the question, is it not about the desktop? I mean, would our desktops be fine? But is it a problem that uh, there is a huge dependency in the public administration on Microsoft Office and Microsoft Exchange? So it doesn't matter what, how good your desktop below that is, even if it's better, uh, the, those systems don't run there, so you're not able to be able to switch anyone, could also be, but then still, why are so many people in our own community running out our operating system? The other question is, did we concentrate too much in our communication to friends and people around us about the cost saving? So, do we concentrate too much to highlight that free software, it's cheaper in the long run and that it's mainly about costs. 
And there the question is, like, if, if we constantly do that, also with our friends and people around us, people will often associate free software with it's the cheaper solution. So if I don't have a, higher, um, a big enough budget, I still have the possibility to move to free software. With this approach, people, they will not allocate enough budget to move and migrate to free software. Migration will also always cost a lot. And why should free software be cheaper than proprietary software in the short term? I mean, in the long run, maybe yes, but still, this connection with it's cheaper, it's maybe greatest, is that something which we can fix by already um, educating people around us that you have to pay for free software too? When we provide something to them, we can also ask them to pay for that. And the question is if sometimes we might not encourage people in our community or companies that they are charging for free software. Sometimes some people of us, they are attacking people because they put a price tag on, on free software. Can we move, uh, change the perception there in another direction if we are more regularly charging for it and supporting people who are charging for free software, if it's individuals or companies. And that's maybe one of the most provocative. Do we sometimes harm ourselves by volunteering? And that's from the, the situation that sometimes with those migrations, you either have staffers or external volunteers who want it so much that public administrations or H, um, schools or other, uh, other organizations are switching to free software that they say, well, I will invest a lot of my free time into that or a lot of energy into that. So they start doing that also there is no budget allocated to it. And their boss says, yeah, okay, I mean, you now convinced me or you, you told me about those advantages now for several years, go ahead. And then you invest a lot of time and energy into that. And after a few years, I mean, you might be able to, to cope with a lot of those challenges, but after some time, you might face a lot of problems. And if you don't have a budget then to get help from external people, you will most likely fail. So what happens usually is that then the bosses, they don't think like, oh, so the problem was that we didn't allocate budget so that uh, we could get external professional help for our migrations. But the result is mostly, oh, so free software doesn't work. Let's allocate some budget and do it with a proprietary company the right way. So the question is, do we sometimes by investing too much of our time and energy into switching people to free software without the appropriate budget harm free software in the long run? And is it not sustainable enough if we do it that way? Might we even have to tell people when they want like to move to free software, when they don't have a budget, tell them, well, don't do it, stay. Concentrate your smaller budgets on, on something else. So yeah, then another question is, did we focus too much on the operating system? and two less on applications. And that's, that's two questions actually, on one side. I think it's, it's also understandable. A lot of people from us, we, we use our operating system and we are very happy with those operating systems and we would like others to also benefit about, uh, from them. So we are not that much interested in all the other applications which public administrations are running. They are very complicated and often boring. But by focusing on the, on the operating system, is, is that the right thing for the public administrations and uh, then to, to switch their operating system? Or wouldn't they benefit more if we are concentrating more on making sure that all the applications in the first run will be free software there? On the other side, there was also maybe another uh, part that some people internally of uh, public administrations focus too much on the operating system. So maybe instead of focusing on the applications more, they first started to build their own distributions for the migration. Might that be a mistake? Might it be better to use standard free software distributions and focus more on the applications where more people in the, in the organization might see uh, differences? And the other question is, might we 
is it possible that we concentrated too much on a few stars? And is that a problem in the long run when you are putting too much of your arguments in one place? So my observation for a long time was when people asked, like, does free software work in public administration or in general? People said, yes, Munich. And that was the default answer of many people. The problem is that, I mean, as we saw, in one city, it's not just a technical uh, component which uh, is responsible for the success or the failure of something. But if we always just mention a few examples and, and put uh, projects in, in those star positions, that might be very harmful for us in the long run. And on the other hand, do we actually still need it? We are now in a, in a situation where so many companies are using free software out there and also public, public administrations, when you go away from the, from the desktop part, in so many places they are using free software, free software applications to, to solve their jobs. So wouldn't it be better to concentrate on showing those examples, what you can do with free software in the public administration, and not so much focus on desktop or um, on a few examples where, where they achieve that? So yeah, now I ask a lot of questions and I'm very much looking forward to discuss them later with you. And uh, I also want to give you a short outview what we at the FSFE want to do in the next months and years probably because that will not be a short-term project. So we are at the moment in the process to start a campaign. It's called Public Money, Public Code. Our belief is that public administrations, whenever software is produced with public money, it should be published under free software license. That should be the baseline. And we are at the moment uh, starting with that, gathering a lot of information. So we believe that there, the default in public administration should be that they reuse software again when they develop something, that they uh, share new applications, and all of that independent of the operating system. So it's not just about software which is running on Linux, it's about software which is running on Windows, which is running on Mac OS, on Chrome OS, or whatever they are using. We would like that to be free software. We would like them to be able to, to share software with each other. It's not about cost savings. We believe that the IT will be better. They will be in control of their IT when using free software. And we think that by that they will also give a better service to their citizens. So yeah, uh, this one is a picture this year at the I Love Free Software Day in February where uh, some volunteers, they use projectors to project this message already at government buildings. Uh, because we think that in this time we also need good pictures with the press. So that picture was already also used by Investigate Europe in their reporting about Microsoft's dependency. The other thing what we are doing there is that we are gathering quotes from uh, people who are supporting that, I mean, in that case the European Commission, but we would like to have better support like from people, from companies, from, uh, from politicians, celebrities, so whoever also would th believes that it's more about sharing and reusing government's uh, software in instead of procuring something again and again. We are looking for good examples about that, so not like desktop uses, but more applications. For example, I mean, many people heard about, uh, about, about Munich in free software, but who of you knows Fix My Street? So Fix My Street was developed in the UK. It's a software you, where you can report problems when the, when the road is damaged and you can help your public administration to fix this. This is meanwhile used in eight countries around the world. They are using the same software. It's free software. You can have apps to, to report that. Those are examples we which, which we would like to highlight, how public administrations can benefit from sharing this. With this example, the Berlin city, just a few months ago, they developed their own software, doing exactly the same thing, it cost one million euro. So, and if you are interested to help with that, we would be very happy if you join us. One of the most important things we are doing there at the moment is that we are gathering a lot of data. How is software procured at the moment? Um, how, uh, what kind of software do they procure? How often do public administrations procure the same software again? For that, we are starting a lot of freedom of information requests to public administrations. 
And at the URL down there, um, there are examples for different countries, uh, for different cities, so you can use that and uh, submit that to your city. On a lot of uh, countries, there are also platforms which make it very easy to do those requests to governments. We documented that when we knew about it. When you know about no more, add that to the wiki. It will not be that much time for you to decide uh, to, to make those submissions, but in total, when all of us do that, we will have a very good database for uh, the future campaign. So, before I go with you to the Q&A, I would like to end with one quote from uh, my first teacher, actually. Many small, uh, no, he, he wrote that down for me, so he didn't in, in, invent that, <laughs> just to clarify that. So many small people in many small places do many small things which will change the face of the world. So every action counts. So whatever you do, if you are developing, packaging, distributing free software, if you're documenting it or translating it, or if you're helping new users or developers to get active in free software, all of that, it might not seem big at the time you do it. But all the different activities by all the different people together in so many places, that will change the world. So thank you for helping us to change the world and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think that was a great presentation and I think we shouldn't see it all too negative. I mean, if they really move back to Windows and uh, the whole administration gets fucked up by a crypto troy and it's much easier to ask the friends from NSA to get a backup. So I think it's not that bad. But uh, aside of the jokes, uh, two things I would like to address. First thing is, was there ever an evaluation whether the new operating system by, by uh, Microsoft is Windows 10 is according to the German, uh, I think, Betriebsverfassungsgesetz, it's called. Because only the part of the information that they are transferring to a service abroad uh, may already violate this law. The second thing, um, you're asking whether we are um, focusing too much on operating systems instead of applications. I think uh, applications is not that what a company wants. They want solutions. I mean, in the end of the day, you don't want to buy a drill machine. You want a hole in the wall, right? So I think we as a community should more focus on solutions that we could provide, not even on applications or uh, operating systems. Hmm. Just as an idea. Thanks. So, yeah, thank you very much. So for the, for the first question, I'm not aware that they did an evaluation about that. From what I saw, there was no reason, real evaluation about this move at all. So it felt a little bit like we want to switch to Microsoft Windows because we want to switch to Microsoft Windows. It doesn't make sense in a lot of, uh, from a lot of aspects because they, they also have this goal that in five years they would like to be independent of the, uh, of the operating system. So why now focus on migrating the operating systems when in five years they would like to be independent of the operating systems? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But in, in general, I haven't seen any, any evaluation there. It was not the evaluation of uh, the, the City Council of Munich, okay. but it could be more an idea for the Free Software Foundation. I guess you have some lawyers as well uh, mm -hmm. who may be able to check that. Okay, I'll, I'll note that down, but uh, yeah, but till now I'm not aware of that. And for the second uh, edition, yes, you're right. It's even better focus on solution than on applications that might even be better than uh, yeah, calling it applications. So, thank you. Um, just to reiterate what uh, the other um, comment before, um, in 2018, like next year, we will have a new uh, data protection law throughout Europe, which is even stricter and uh, enforcing that will, even, will become even harder with Windows 10 or whatever. So that's definitely one thing that the free software um, 
Foundation and, and other free software initiatives should focus on when we are trying to gather selling points for open source. And yeah, that requires some legal uh, advice. Uh, I'm pretty sure you do have some, some competent lawyers, but we need to stress that message more often, I think. Yeah, that might be, might be a good thing. Uh, such analysis often costs a lot of money. So everybody who is interested in that, if, uh, if you support it or if you know other organizations which are also interested in that, in joining this, then uh, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I think also that um, there is uh, probably, uh, there are some, th there will be probably some, some uh, issues there as from, from everything which you see from the city of Munich. It's, it's already very much tailored to go to, um, Office 365 and a lot of uh, things which will not, not run locally at the beginning. But yeah. I also appreciate uh, the call that you give to us to, to reflect on, on what part, what role that we will continue to play with, with these sorts of uh, adoptions that come forth. You mentioned that this would likely be the end of Munich being considered a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Are there other public service entities, particularly large-scale ones like the city of Munich, that we can now look to to, to to be that lighthouse at this point? Are there others that are investigating from a public sector using open source at that kind of scale that, that we can now call the lighthouse? So first, I don't know if, if that got clear, I'm somehow reluctant uh, about those big stars at all. So it's, it's always, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, different organizations are doing good things, but sometimes those organizations then also change. For example, there was a, a very nice policy uh, from the White House last year that uh, all, uh, when, when they develop new free software, it should be 20% uh, of that should afterwards be published under free software license, a very nice policy. Uh, so that was nice example at that time. Now it's getting more difficult with using that as a good example. It's also for some uh, some organizations they, or countries they have quite good policies. Like Russia introduced some free software policies. China is also using a lot of free software. The question is, do you want to have them as the uh, shining examples of free software use? I think we should, uh, I mean, and there are also other, other desktop users, the, the Gendarmerie in France, also from the research from Investigate Europe, we also learned that they are under permanent pressure from other organizations which try to um, get them to switch back again. So in general, for a public administration which is, which is switching to free software, it's very difficult to be on a public spot. It's also very difficult with proprietary uh, software for public administration to be in the spotlight. So I don't think we should put that many organizations which are moving to free software in this position that they don't uh, have time to do a migration or to deal with their IT, but that they have to answer lots of public requests, deal with a lot of questions from all kind of parties and so on. So that's another issue which is problematic there. But I think we should I think we should focus more on lots of smaller examples where people, uh, organizations did some nice things. Like the example with Fix My Street, that's a nice thing where one government started with it and then several others are using it. And if you, if you look, for example, at the, at the website Join Up from the European Commission, there are regular examples of what public administrations are doing with free software. Some of them are better, some of them are uh, not so good maybe from a free software perspective, but there are a lot of examples out there. And I would argue more for pick some examples which you like there, and we don't even have to coordinate which examples we pick because pick those you like most, and then it's more distributed and we have way more examples about free software. It's not looking like Linux is just used by Munich, but people learn about different examples from different people. So I don't want to tell you one or two examples which you then will use. Search your own. There are enough out there. Yeah. So two comments. First of all, on the data protection laws, I wouldn't be too enthusiastic because those guys at Microsoft aren't dumb. They have already established a fully German 365 with Telecom. So for example, if anyone just has that problem with 
data going to the US, they can claim, no, we have one that is work that's managed by Deutsche Telekom, it's fully approved by the governments and so on. So, yeah, there, there will be some way of uh, making this a topic, but they have already thought about many of those mm -hmm. things. And other workloads are going into the cloud, so I'm sure that legislation will also take this into account. To some extent, on the other hand, the cloud is a good thing for us because the desktop applications are no real reason anymore. I'm seeing more people do presentations live off Google Docs than they are using um, PowerPoint these days. So that's an argument where I think Munich is kind of late in the game. They, they are trying to switch back in a time where everyone else has realized, well, I may only need my iPad, my Android device, my Linux device with a browser, and I, I can have access to all those things, which basically also is my, my, my second big point. There is a very popular Linux-based desktop OS, Chrome OS, that is market leader in the US educational market. So, of course, we wouldn't call it a free Linux OS. It has quite some uh, uh, strings attached, but it shows that if someone focuses on the whole ecosystem, how can I get my applications to run? How can I make user management easy? Uh, locking down systems for like students or uh, employees, uh, then those things can fly. Yeah? I think it's just a matter of fragmentation uh, between all the vendors and it's very hard to do an open source implementation of a strictly enforced mm -hmm. framework. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a uh, few uh, like notes. Uh, I'm kind of involved uh, in this open source initiative in the Czech Republic. And what I, uh, I can see uh, is that always is about the money. As you mentioned, that uh, if there is anything about we can switch to open source, uh, what we can save. But uh, I think that uh, even you mentioned it in the end of your presentation that uh, it should be uh, more like that, uh, anything which is funded by the government or the public money that should be open source or that we should own the, uh, the code or it should be public domain. And I think this is what can be highlighted and it's uh, like one of the reasons why to do that. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's on Linux or anything else. And the other notes are, even if like Munich uh, fell uh, as lighthouse, uh, we can take it as an opportunity to uh, think about the new uh, new starts and learn from that. And actually, this is what we are trying to do in the Czech Republic: that we can uh, learn from not mistakes, but uh, what didn't uh, go well. And uh, the last note is that uh, I think that. Uh, mostly what is discussed, if uh, it's uh, anything about open source in public sector, is that uh, we are talking about consequences, but not the cause. Like, uh, uh, for example, uh, before we switch, uh, there should be some kind of a, a talk or discussion about like uh, what, what we want to switch, or uh, do we have uh, enough inputs like from the from the sec, uh, sections uh, of the, uh, the or departments, what kind of information they want to share, or what they need to share, what they what, what they uh, need to work with. So, for me, it basically it's that we are or like the government or uh, offices are switching to open source, but uh, they don't evaluate inputs for that, which can lead afterwards to a failure because this is not working because nobody uh, nobody know uh, know before that this should be in this way so i think that uh, if this change that uh, there should be a preparation and that uh, that b before that migration starts that there will be a clear data what is needed or what the departments need uh, then it can help even with the migration and even with public opinion. Okay, thank you for the for the comment. I just I, 
I, I realized one thing, maybe I was a bit too, um, too negative about that because you, you mentioned uh, that Linux failed. I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, I'm not, I don't think that it was a failure. Uh, just to, to glorify that. And I, even, I mean, with the costs, uh, with the savings and so on, the, uh, there was at least one, one huge, one huge benefit, not so much from Munich, but for all the rest of the public administrations around the world, or at least in Europe, by them showing that there is another way of doing it, all the other public administrations benefited because, in my opinion, Microsoft had to calculate that in their prices, that there is another option. And also from those uh, research from Investigate Europe, we learned that um, public administrations got a huge cut in their, uh, in their prices with Microsoft when they mentioned that they might switch to GNU Linux. So even if all, all the rest of it was not successful, it was not a failure. Just to, to clarify that, that point. So, yeah. Ah. Hi, Matthias. So first, thanks for your great talk and also your great work. I appreciate it a lot. And I want to address the infamous desktop and usability issue. So I talked to a few people that were more or less involved in the Linux issue and uh, some quite terrible stories reached me of secretaries that just basically couldn't work anymore. They were running out of the offices crying because they couldn't do their task. And one issue in Munich was that the city failed to educate their staff. So when you have users and you make a big change, and even if you just change the desktop from Windows to Linux, and even if you try to look or make it visually the same, it's a different usability and you need to teach the people. So this is something the city failed at entirely. And this is an important point also for the desktop or the free software in general, it's about the users. I see that the community is sometimes very self-centered, so the, the it works for me doesn't mean that it works for other people. And a nice example I take is email clients. There is no email client that doesn't suck a lot. All email clients suck and there is no way that I can, for instance, get my mother to use MUT because it's not a way how she would like to interact with the computer. So I see a lot of space for improvement uh, regarding the usability. And if we want more people to use the desktop or also the applications, we need to make and develop them and make them look like in a way they want to interact with the computer. And this is why I also guess Chrome OS is uh, so uh, successful, especially in the US, because it just works like people want the computer to work like. And although, yes, there is uh, Linux or some Gen 2 below or underneath, it's not free software at all. But in the end, this is something I would recommend my mother to use because it just sucks less than others. Um, that's basically my point. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I, I totally agree that uh, there are a lot of uh, ways on how we can improve the usability of free software. I think it's also partly connected with the question I raised if maybe we should, uh, we should also encourage more people to pay for free software because you can use that to get other people involved who focus on usability instead of uh, implementing mainly functions. I, I'm not so sure if if, um, if the Linux project if they completely sucked at doing uh, like in including the users there. I mean, in comparison with other public administrations, my impression was that they were even better including them than in in some other administrations when they switched from one Microsoft version to the other and also those things all changed or from one Office version to the other. So I, I'm I'm not sure on on how much we we should blame them there, but it's a, it's a huge effort to help uh, users to migrate from one software to the other, and it's often underrated uh, how much resources you need for that. And uh, beside that, I'm very happy to afterwards discuss uh, uh, the usability of email clients and would argue that there are some good email clients which also suck less, but yeah, that's for later, I think. Okay, uh, last question, anyone, anyone have? Okay. 
Uh, okay, thank you very much for a great talk. And I think uh, I want to address about the problem, why, it's, why it happens. Can you move your mic a little bit up? Okay. Ah, sorry. Yeah, for me, the problem is about uh, educational socialization because most of the user, for instance, like in my case, when the first time I changed from, Linux, uh, from Windows to Linux, the first things that are in my mind is, well, it's Linux, it's pretty difficult. And how can I install my software? I, how can I install the things? How can I install everything? But since the software that I'm working on only, only works in Linux, then, well, I should to learn. Then after I learn, the more I learn, then I think, ah, oh, well, it's not really bad. Mm -hmm. And it's not really bad. And I even can, you know, sometimes, for instance, like in LibreOffice uh, drawing, you can, you can, I can uh, manipulate some, some picture to mm -hmm. some publication instead of spend the time in Corel Draw in Windows. So, yeah, I think maybe because most of the, of the users is not from the IT, they are, okay, you should be using Linux. And they go, okay, well, it's like a black screen in the, in the desktop. And they will be thinking twice before, when they are growing with the Windows. And they should be thinking twice to change in, in, in another uh, open source, something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, thank you all very much for having me here again. Thank you for all your work for free software. And yeah, looking forward to discussing with you.